Hi everyone and welcome back to the online summit Communities for Future. We have the honor today to spend some time with Willem Ferverda, who studied tropical ecology and environmental science at Amsterdam and Bogota, Colombia, and has a background in both nonprofit and for-profit organizations. Willem worked in many countries in Latin America, Africa, Asia, and from 2000 to 2012, he was the director of the International Union for Conservation of Nature in the Netherlands. In 2013, Willem co-founded the Common Land Foundation. The Common Land Foundation is on a mission to transform degraded landscapes into thriving ecosystems and communities based on sound business approaches and aligned with international policies and guidelines. Since 2013, the Common Land, Common Land Foundation has worked tirelessly to build a universal proof of concept that brings farmers, landowners, entrepreneurs, communities, nature preservation organizations, and legislators together to create real returns on investments per hectare. Called the four returns, this framework is capable of implementing large scale and long-term restoration initiatives. The Common Land Foundation says, we are doers, not dreamers. Together with our partners, we are committed to transforming 100 million hectares of degraded land into thriving ecosystems and communities by 2040. Really impressive, Willem. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. And we are really excited to hear more from you about the Common Land Foundation and the work that you do. And I'd love to start by hearing from you, what were the ingredients that shaped your path through life? Ooh, wow. Thank you very much for, um, for, for, for sharing, for being here. And uh, yeah, what a wonderful question. Um, I hope we have sufficient time, but I think the, yeah, the ingredients started very early already when I was just very young as a, as a kid. Um, I always was fascinated by nature, uh, although I was raised in Amsterdam, you know, in a city. Um, but actually, I realized already as a young boy that the city wasn't the place for me to be. Uh, so I was wandering around in all those small places where there was still some nature within, the, within that city, uh, finding, you know, animals, whatever, uh, and quite often brought them to home, uh, you know, from from salamanders to, to hedgehogs, you name it. And I think there, the first uh, inspiration came to me and, and that, that just evolved and, and uh, uh, increased over the years. And I, I, uh, I was also touched by the, let's say, the, the deeper, yeah, the deeper understanding of nature and the, the uh, power of uh, bringing me to myself, if I explain it well. So as a young boy, I was, of course, you know, full of energy and not always easy to handle at school. Um, but when I, went, when I went out and just was sitting on a tree, uh, I came into a kind of meditational face or, or, or being, and that helped me a lot to, to get more, to be more focused and uh, to understand and feel the, the profound, uh, yeah, healing power, you could say, of nature. So that started from the beginning already when I was eight to 10 years old. And I remember um, a wonderful experience with my father in Italy when we were, you know, out there for a holiday, a summer holiday, and uh, that we were walking near a lake i think it was one of those 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 northern lakes and uh, we found a snake and and that snake actually was was you know some italian people were standing there were trying to kill it basically so it wasn't a, it was a sad story and i was just you know amazed that it was the first time i saw a snake in the wild you could say and uh, as a as a kid 
and was looking at that snake, you know, looking very deep into to the eye of the snake and asked the question, why do they do this, these folks? Why do, are they throwing stones to you and hitting you with sticks? And the immediate answer came, you know, from that snake that they were hitting themselves. That was the answer. And these kind of experiences I had several times, and I think that framed me. Uh, and uh, so it wasn't a big choice. I was, it was easy to, you know, to go through school and, and, and choose for biology and study ecology, vegetation science and, and restoration ecology at the end. And of course in the tropics, because there you have most of the biodiversity of this planet. So it was a logical choice to go as soon as possible to the tropics. So when I was 21, I think I took the cheapest ticket, bought the cheapest ticket. And that time it was to Colombo, Sri Lanka, I traveled in Sri Lanka and India. And after coming back, uh, you know, uh, after this sabbatical within my study, that was you know, at that time it was still possible. I choose for, uh, for tropical ecology. Mm. And uh, the University of Amsterdam sent me to Colombia. Mm. So, uh, of course, that was in the middle of the civil war. But, you know, it was, be yeah, you, we, had, uh, we had a great time and started studying tropical ecology and vegetation science in the Paramo ecosystem in the Andes in Colombia. And the interaction between, let's say, poor farmers and clear cutting of the Paramo uh, high Andean you could say almost a cloud forest system, grassland system, uh, that they were c converting into agriculture. They were you know, the colonists, you could say, the poor colonists to convert those virgin areas in, 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 yeah, in monocultures of potatoes and, and beans and so on, um, to roll that, to roll it out, uh, you could say. And uh, so I learned a lot about can vegeta can uh, you know what does it take for a natural vegetation to come back after years of fallow land and if it will not come back what will be the new situation you know of agriculture or intense agriculture with chemicals and so on and how does that interact on on the communities as well as on the biodiversity what yeah. is the impact of that mm. so that was my my first 25, 27 years. Yeah, you know, beautiful. So in a nutshell. Yeah. yeah. I really love how you share that nature helped you come back to yourself and that mm -hmm. you had that experience as a young child because I think so many of us can connect to that and link mm -hmm. to that. So it's beautiful mm -hmm. to say it in those simple words. Yeah, I was lucky. I realized that I was lucky that I was able to capture that already when I was very young. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then you went on to work for a long time for the International Union for Conservation of Nature. And, you know, that's again a, a very particular entrance door into engaging with nature. So what did you learn from those years? Yeah, now maybe after my study of, you know, when I left university as a, as a, you know, a tropical ecologist, it was very tough to find a job. I mean, at that time, ecologists were just not very high ranked in the career, in the path for a, you know, a great career. So um, before entering the IUCN, eh, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, I needed to find a job. And uh, because that was tough, uh, most of my colleagues uh, became unemployed. Uh, we are talking about the beginning of the 90s, the end of the 80s. And uh, so we started with some unemployed biologists, a travel agency, an ecotourism travel agency. And because I was the only one who spoke, who spoke Spanish, they immediately uh, asked me to do Spain and Latin America. And uh, so for six, no, for, for nine years, uh, we I was able to develop programs in Spain and Latin America and travel to those places, uh, do all the work, you know, from, from, from writing brochures or doing the investigation. You know, this was a, a, a period without internet. So uh, you need to go there 
and make a deal with the local hotel owners and so on and 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 the air carriers to uh, to to organize that, those expeditions so that that helped me a lot to learn to work with groups quite often high educated people hmm. international and um, from the netherlands uh, to bring them to you know remote areas and organize all that that stuff you know kind of a tour operator for expeditions but also go to the places of a you know of a high interest in biodiversity so rural you know national parks where normally people would never go to because they were really off the beaten track and um yeah that 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 period was actually important to uh first of all to be an entrepreneur we were you know basically setting up a company and that company is really doing well it still exists it's the biggest ecotourism company of the netherlands maybe one of the biggest of europe and um and was able to go to all those parks and protected areas and understand and see how fast the degradation or the conversion thanks to agriculture developments or mining or or oil and gas and so on was uh, depleting those areas so you could see every year and year you could see that the rainforest was disappearing faster that the uh, the people were moving in and uh, as, you know how this normally works is that poor you know they, they make a road in the rainforest and then poor people move in because as the longer they stay there they get access to land and they they own the land at a certain moment in in places like peru or colombia or or, or ecuador or brazil so i saw all those processes uh sad processes in a way but also understandable because those people were poor they needed to have access to land they wanted to survive hmm. and quite often if you were talking to those colonos those people they realized that what they were doing was not right you know or that they didn't like to cut trees and these kind of things so that was a, that was a very intensive and good period in the field yeah and then i moved to ifcn indeed uh, uh yeah yeah so how was that move yeah now that was uh yeah i always wanted to work for a concert for a conservation organization and iucn is a science science based network organization you know where you have several members of ngos scientists and governments i thought that was the ideal place to uh, to learn and to 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 work so when when i was able to to uh, move to uh, a very tiny office at that time of IUCN Netherlands. Uh, uh, I was able to, to, to head a fund from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs on rainforest conservation. So I was able to spend money in small grants to a lot of NGOs in, in like 40, almost 50 countries mm. in the tropics. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, of course, great if you're in the position to decide and to help NGOs to grow uh, and to, to support them and to give away, you know, 100,000 euros to one and to another to look into what they can do with it. And, and then you really understand the toughness of this topic. So I was able to, at that time, to, um, to head, I think it was like 5 million euros per year to spend it in small grants. Later, it uh, became larger, up to 10 million. So I did it for four and a half years, almost five years, and then became a director of IUCN Netherlands. Uh, and that basically you know, consisted of, of four different types of work. Uh, first of all, um, fund organizations with Dutch ODA and lottery money, um, like 10 to 15 million second per year the second uh, build a network and and maintain the network of ngos and governments and also connect it to the international arena of iucn with other countries and other partners uh, third one was uh, to look into the topic of the dutch impact on the world ecology so we wrote several reports on you know the dutch impact of mining in the world ecology or energy or um, or livestock and so on which is you know and and if you put it in these kind of words you know uh, the netherlands has a huge impact on rainforest destruction with with, with companies with, with or quite often with, with you know companies like unilever or, or rabobank and shell 
Mm. And the last one was, uh, that was, I started that in 2005 together with McKinsey and Egon Zeinder to start a dialogue with companies, uh, first in the Netherlands and later also in, in uh, Brazil and Switzerland and India. It, it was called Leaders for Nature. It was a, a dialogue session between uh, large multinationals uh, and their different layers from CEO to, uh, to young professionals and conservation organizations. Because I felt, you know, what, what is needed is, uh, uh, first of all, we need, we need a common approach to deal with these topics. And yeah, for corporates, it's very un- difficult to understand this topic and their impact. Um, so the first thing you need to do is start talking with each other so that within the corporate world, they understand better how, what ecology and biodiversity and conservation means and indigenous people and, and their rights and so all these things. And for the, let's say for the ecologists, it was also a way to, to connect, to see that there were still working normal people uh, with, uh, and, and good people in those companies and they were not all against uh, you know, conservation, they, but there were people who were worried about these kind of things. So it was a, it was a good process. Well, thank you, Willem, for sharing quite a bit about the different steps that you took before co-founding the Common Land Foundation. And I'd love to zoom in on that because it sounds as if in the Common Land Foundation, you've brought together a lot of your experience and what you've learned before. Can you explain why return on investment, making a profit, from the investment per hectare of land is such an important ingredient of the Common Land Foundation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now maybe I, I'll, so, so when I, at a certain moment, I left the conservation world. That was in 2012. Um, I already met John D. Liu in 2009 at the conference. So when we met, we said, listen, I just told him after that presentation on the Lus Plateau in China, he made these, this, this beautiful documentary. And he said, this is so important what you're doing. We will work together for the rest of our life. That, that was basically the first thing I said to him in 2009 when I was in Sweden. And, and that's what we did. So I brought him to IUC in Netherlands, uh, actually, uh, and, and supported him and financed him to do more film work and and... And, and work on the different documentaries. And I still, you know, he's still in our team since then, in Commonland team now, then, then he was at, at IUCN. Um, but I left IUCN in 2012 because I really, you know, thought, you know, maybe I can contribute to find a language that investors and conservationists, as well as local people, farmers and indigenous people on the ground, uh, will understand. Uh, I have been in so many sessions and meetings and conferences where there was a complete misunderstanding between uh, farmers and and conservationists, uh, between investors and and governments. And so when they were sitting around the table, uh, quite often with those corporates as well, there was just a mismatch. Uh, you know, there was two different worlds that came together: the world of finance and and business making profit, uh, so max- maximizing return on investment, and the world of, uh, of farming in one way, as well as the world of conservation and protection of natural, you know, natural areas, so biodiversity. So the rural side, and within the rural world, you had this, competi- this, this difficult and this tension between, let's say, uh, land tenure uh, issues and um, and uh, conservation issues and optimizing production issues uh, per hectare. So you had a very strong border between what is nature and what is production land. Mm. Uh, so when I realized all these difficulties in, in, in different narratives of people, I thought, you know, this will never, we will never get a world where you can find the balance between, let's say, people, nature, and productivity. Uh, it will always be a competition of land or, or you know, hectares. Uh, and I took a sabbatical. I traveled all around the world and interviewed farmers in 2012 and, and investors. Because I knew the conservation experts, uh, I knew my colleagues very well, so I didn't, you know, 
focus too much on them, but I focus on farmers and investors. So I went to London, New York, Frankfurt, those places, to those uh, cities, and spoke with pension funds and private investors. And I went to you know places like El Salvador, India, Turkey, uh, Ecuador, uh, South Africa, Kenya, uh, to talk with farmers, but also to, to places like the Netherlands and the UK and, and US, so wealthy farmers and poor farmers. Basically, ask both of them two questions. What is your biggest frustration? And what is your dream? And the farmers, they actually all said, my biggest frustration that I, is that I cannot hand over my land in a better condition as I have received it from my father or mother. Mm. And my biggest dream is to get a fair price for my products, but also a better environment so that I can find a combination uh, of, 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 of you know, making this area more beautiful, uh, but still uh, can, can live well. The investors had, they had, in general, they had different frustrations. So I think the big, biggest frustration was that they couldn't find pipeline. There was no pipeline, so project pipeline, to invest in, in a sustainable way. They, they, they find a lot of pipe. So let's say the pipeline for investors are projects and they all, you know, all those investors are looking for the best pipeline that that project that will deliver sufficient financial returns, but are also increasingly very sustainable. But their frustration was that they couldn't find projects that were positive in all sense. Uh, in general, the more sustainable projects were doing less bad. Uh, less emissions, less pollution, or less, uh, less uh, you know, problems with human rights, these kind of things. And their frustration also was that their kids were pushing on those folks to, uh, to do more good for the world. Uh, you could say the, uh, you could already, they weren't there yet, the extinction rebellion people, but you, they were, the, the, the feeling was already there. Yeah. So, their dream was to do good, but they couldn't do good, basically. Mm -hmm. They were forced into a system that was based on maximizing return on investments uh, for the pensions or for their shareholders. So these two worlds, I thought, I need to make a, build a bridge between those two worlds, you know, people on the ground and the people with the money. Mm -hmm. um, and I went back to the land to those rural degraded areas, whether it's in Spain to the Mediterranean or Middle East, you know, you find them everywhere. There's more than 2 billion hectares now, very degraded on the world. So that's double the size of China or the US and China together, that's huge. Um, and I looked very good to what is happening in those rural areas. And I realized if you really bring it down, you can see that there are four losses in those areas. First of all, there's a loss of biodiversity and natural and soil and vegetation cover and, and you name it. The second is there's a loss of economic activity because people are at a certain moment, they're, they're, they're fed up and, le and leave for the cities. That's why you have migration to the cities. Yeah. So they leave the countryside abandoned. Uh, the third thing is that because there's a la lack of economic activity, they, people lose their jobs. So if, if you have smallholders and the land turn into a monoculture of a few holders, then people lose their jobs. And maybe the most important thing I realized when talking to poor farmers, you know, in Burkina Faso and all those places is that they have lost their pride and their hope. Hmm. So I thought if these four losses are the real bottom line as key aspects of a degraded land, then we need to talk in a different language and turn them into returns. I mean, the, the word return was very much recognized by farmers, by governments, by, 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 by investors, of course, not very much by ecologists, but so, so that was when I started to come up with the idea, which was always my dream. I wanted to create a universal framework for landscape, restoration or integrated landscape management uh, in such a way that people would understand it, that it could be measurable, but it should be inclusive and systemic and, um, and long-term. 
so, so, so then I had the four returns. So I turned those four losses into four returns. And the first one was the return of inspiration uh, or the return of hope, which you can measure. There are indicators for it. The second one is return of jobs, social capital. The third one, of course, return of biodiversity, uh, natural capital. And with these three returns, you could create sustainable financial returns because you are starting with a different land use, way of land use, uh, from, from, from degradable ways of land use to regenerative ways of land use. And we'll come back to that later. So those four returns were the first step. But as an ecologist that always had been working in the field or has been working with NGOs and governments and so on in the field, uh, I was always thinking in zoning. So you cannot, you know, for returns is just kind of theory. But if you bring it back to the land, you need to think in, in zoning. So if you, and you need to think in something that has been called the ecosystem approach. So 20 years ago, IUCN and the Convention on Biological Diversity, they, they were aligned on something called the ecosystem approach. That is an approach to look towards ecosystems and to work with ecosystems. But that's very theory, theoretical. But I use that ecosystem approach in a zoning approach. And I made it simple because otherwise it would never you know, take off and it would not be practical and people would never understand it. So I thought, okay, those four returns should be delivered by an area that a large ecosystem area it could be a million hectares. So that is a quarter of the Netherlands. So that's pretty big for my country. Um, and that areas, you know, those areas should be divided into three zones. First of all, you have the economic zone. That is the place where you have infrastructure, urban areas, and where people produce things in, you know, with machines and factories and so on. But the economic zone also includes monocultures. So because that's basically an economic way of land use. And then you have the natural zone. In general, people think about the natural zone as protected areas or places where, you know, where you leave nature uh, flourish, quite often also not protected. So that's a place where in general, there's not a lot of economic activity. And the economic activity that you can find there is maybe some timber extraction, but most or hunting or tourism. That's basically what it is. But in protected areas, of course, you want to have it as protected as possible. So the natural zone. But in between, there's not much. If you look on the map in different countries, uh, you find a, hard, a very strict frontier or line between a natural zone and the economic zone so you have monocultures and, and urban areas and you have uh, natural areas mm. and that border is quite often an, a place of conflict because the monocultures want to move up as we see in all you know in, in latin america in rainforest areas they want to move up and, and convert natural systems into monocultures or, or livestock areas so i thought now what we need to identify is a zone in between a combined and i called it the combined zone and the combined zone is a combination of increasing productivity by increasing biodiversity. Mm. So you, you, you produce biodiversity and you produce fruit, timber, cereals, whatever, agricultural products. Quite often the combined zone is now called agroforestry or regenerative agriculture. Yes. But at that time, it wasn't, you know, in 2012, the Region Act was coming up. But this is where regenerative agriculture and agroforestry takes place. So we have, but, but there are two different, two things here. You need, it should increase biodiversity, topsoil, you know, the, the resilience of the system with a, a variety of species, pro, you know, species you can use, eat or use as fiber or whatever. So... Three zones are delivering four returns, but one aspect was lacking. And that was the aspect that always frustrated me a lot when I was working with overseas development money, uh, and that was time. Yes. I was raised uh, in my career as a guy who was always 
you know, needed to deal with a four years or maximum five years time frame of a project because the ministry or the funder said you need to do these things in five years or three years or two years, whatever. Um, so I thought, let's forget about it. We need at least one generation. And I call that, so 20 years. So four turns are delivered by three zones, that is the area, within a minimum period of 20 years. Hmm. And I said, okay, that is the alternative of the current business model of landscapes. And that the current business model of landscape is maximizing return on investment per hectare. That is the current business model. And that leads to degradation everywhere. Pollution, deforestation, overgrazing, overfishing, you know, it's all part of the maximization on return of return on investment, which is the, the belief system that they teach at business schools. But if you add those two words per hectare, you create a, a disaster. Um, and of course, over the last millennium, millennia, this wasn't a big problem, but especially the last 50 and 200 years, you could say with more people, uh, the ex time frame of the acceleration, uh, this is uh, no longer a good system. So gradually I thought these four turns should become the norm, the new norm instead of maximizing return on investment per hectare. But that was in 2012, 2013. And when I founded Common Land in 2013, um, you know, I, I thought, you know, now I've got the theory. I've got it all right, I published it. I, it was reviewed by all kinds of scientists and I published it at the Rotterdam School of Management, the Erasmus University, together with IUCN in Switzerland, the Commission on Ecosystem Management, all, you know, a lot of scientists. And, you know, they all said, yeah, this is nice, uh, do it, go for it. And I wanted to do it. Uh, let's see if this is possible. Let's see if we can find landscapes that are big. You know, we are talking about areas more than 100,000 or 500,000 hectares because it should be an ecosystem, then it will work. And let's try to do it. Uh, but that's tough because you need to have a team to work on it and a, a multidisciplinary team with people from you know ecological agro uh, finance uh, and and of course people background and and start doing it in in, in places um so what has concretely happened yes now the now of course that was in so in 2000 i left in march 2012 rcn it took me a year to 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 do this thinking and write it down first publication um and then in april 2013 I had it more or less clear. Uh, I had this four turns, three zones, 20 years. I wrote down the key indicators and all these things and tested it and then talked to a lot of folks about it, a lot of people and scientists. And, uh, and then the time came, yeah, I need to set up something. And of course, uh, some people asked me to do it. Uh, I think ICN said, please do it within our system. But at a certain moment, I thought, no, I need to have the freedom to develop it, not within a large bureaucratic or large organization. Although, I, you know, I'm still very much an ICN uh, friend, of course, and, and family member. Um, but I wanted to do it. Uh, and I needed to have the freedom. And I started doing it, uh, started to raise money, which was the first tough thing, because you are raising money for what, actually, uh, for, for people, you need to pay salaries, you need to do things. Um, but the, at a certain moment, I was approached by a philanthropist here in the Netherlands. Uh, I, I, I didn't know this person. And he, uh, we, we went into a conversation. And the first thing he said, of course, uh, no, I don't believe what you're saying. I understand it. But, but uh, no, why should, should I pay you so much money to do this? Because my, my, my approach was I need to set up a team. I need to... As fast as possible. I don't. I can't. I can't wait for project money. I need to set up a team first because I need to have the best people to help me doing this. And roughly, I need like twenty-five people. And if you have twenty-five people in Amsterdam doing all kinds of things and travel, you know that costs quite That's a lot a of lot money. Of money. <laughs> uh, so how to get that and how to make sure that that we could start? But after a while, step by step, uh, I was able to raise that money and start working in in South Africa. Uh, in the uh, water catchment of Port Elizabeth, 500,000 hectares. There was already a local NGO called Living Lands working there. And the next step was indeed 
creating business opportunities for farmers uh, to, to build in sustainability in a way. Um, also, Spain was on my list because I really, you know, I've been working in Spain a lot uh, and I knew, I know the interior very well. And I know, and I knew that, you know, Spain was once covered with thick forests. When the Romans came there, it was forested, most of it. Most of Europe. And there were some savanna and steppe ecosystems as well, of course. But most of it was forested. And uh, yeah, when you start deforesting Spain and the whole Mediterranean, actually, because the whole Mediterranean was, uh, you know, mostly forested you create a new kind of ecosystems that are uh, yeah uh, not as resilient for you know for water and 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 and, and agriculture and so on uh, deforestation in combination with overgrazing basically that's what happened in the whole mediterranean so spain was one was on the list and uh, together you know, with the support of this fur, of this philanthropist and and others also the the, the lottery came on board we were able to look into the best places and scout an area in Spain where we actually uh, after uh, you know, started to work. Wonderful. And, you know, we're slowly coming towards the end of this conversation. So mm -hmm. I think it would be wonderful for us to hear about some of the real results that you've had. Yeah, had. yeah. It's been okay. seven years now. So what's happened in South so Africa? So what happened is that Spain? I think um, that... Yeah. How do you concretely work? You know, I think we get yeah. the theory, but what do you do? How do you so do what we So we, we make you, so what we do, the four turns are, pay, are also, we are using, a, a, you could say, a partic participatory approach called the theory U. Yes. So we work with the theory U. The theory U is a co-creation process with groups to get a very good understanding, first of all, of themselves, but also all about their dreams and co-create a dream together at a landscape level. So what mm. we do in those four, we now work in eight countries. And mm. we started in Spain, South Africa, the Netherlands, and in Australia, West Australia. In all those areas, we started to build landscape restoration partnerships with farmers, with protected area managers, sometimes with local governments, and sometimes with, with investors or with commercial people as well, entrepreneurs. And we started to build uh, to give them an overview effect of what is that area and how can it be in the future. You know, the Lus Plateau in China, you see those images before and after. So we will start dreaming with them, but in a very, uh, straight, in a very structured way, using the co-sensing and the co-creation tools of the theory U, which we still use. Mm. You know, so we work with people from the Presencing Institute, a very important partner for us. Yeah. And with them, we were able to map out the area so why why where should the natural zone or the combined zone be what should that combined zone be what kind of business cases do we need to develop there so we were able to work in spain with those farmers we have now almost 300 members there who uh, and they they agreed to start with regenerative almonds uh, so they have some of them already had organic almonds quite most of them you know had just al almonds and those almonds were you know put you know you if you look at the pictures you see kind of desert like landscape with some trees in it rain fed almonds still but of course with climate change with the droughts or the extreme weather events it becomes tougher so we started to a company in in spain uh, that delivers regenerative almonds for a premium price and the more farmers will join we can really you could say fill that combined area, combined zone with regenerative agroforestry, with a regenerative agroforestry system. Not only almonds, also pistachios. So polycropping instead of monocropping, swales in the landscape to capture the water, compost instead of chemicals. All that stuff. We were, you know, it's it's a system change basically. We, so we work in a system change. So in all those four areas, we started a landscape restoration partnership quite often an NGO or an association. And that association started to identify together with us the different business cases we could develop in tourism, in regenerative agriculture, in composting, in rotational beef, all that stuff. So in Australia, we were able to start a company, not we, but the Australians that came to us, they started working with us in 2014. And soon they started the first company called Wide Open Agriculture. And that company is now in rotational beef regenerative uh, agriculture is kind of a trading company 
And they, uh, yeah, the, the big test was there that uh, they said in 2018, we want to be listed. So they started an IPO, an initial public offering uh, to be listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. At that moment, we thought, well, isn't that too early? But they said, you know, this is the best way to do it. Um, if you want to build a movement, you need to speak the language of farmers. They understand that language. They don't understand the language of NGOs. So we started that company. And now we, um, we are in the process in West Australia that we are participating in a movement on regenerative agriculture and, and community building around landscaping. Also with, with, with great folks who are working with, with the Presencing Institute of uh, using the theory you, and, and now even also the Aboriginal community became interested. So there will be more companies uh, that are looking, that more regenerative companies um, uh, being developed in, in those places, in that huge landscape in Australia. So in those, same thing happened in the Netherlands uh, and, and, and uh, as I said, in South Africa, where we were able to get with this local NGO Living Lands and the consultancy that we have been starting there, uh, which is now independent, grounded, to, to, uh, to um, work with the farmers and help them to, let's say, change their way of living from using goats, angora goats that were overgrazing the hillsides, and we moved them to uh, a way of regenerative aromatic oil production. And we built a plant even there, a distillery plant in, 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 you know, in their valley. Hmm. So, and now step by step, this aromatic oil is, 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 is going to have access to, uh, to the global market because the quality is quite good and the story is good. So we all part of that now. And uh, maybe the most important thing is we see that this after, because we have faced a lot of problems and a lot of challenges, of course, this is not easy. The areas are huge, uh, but now we are gradually into, um, yeah, the, the going to a next phase that people understand that this framework works. We also know and understand how much it will cost more or less per year to do this, to work on this in such a way and to, to, to bring in commercial money. It is not easy, but we, we still need a lot of grants and subsidies to make it happen. But um, we have learned so many lessons that we decided uh, that this year and next year we will uh, go faster and, and go into, uh, you could say, in the next phase where we would share our stories and, and, and show uh, to others how it can work. It's wonderful, Willem. And, you know, it sounds to me like what you're doing is facilitating large scale regeneration of whole patches of world, you know, and just having yeah. heard about the billions of hectares that are completely degraded at the moment. Mm -hmm. This is such important work. Mm -hmm. I also see that there is a real opportunity. I, I notice I'd love to speak to you again. I'd love for the Global Ecovillage Network to start partnering with the Common Land Foundation because mm -hmm. I feel there's a lot of similarity. And I think many of the ecovillages have actually been poised at that intersection of economic area and natural mm -hmm. systems area. You know, and we've been watching the biodiversity move in as. Mm -hmm communities start caretaking of the ecosystems around them. But at the same time, one of the big weaknesses of the eco-village approach has been around economic viability mm -hmm. and the deep collaboration with the whole systems that they're embedded in, also the economic mm -hmm. systems of their bioregions. So how could eco-villages, you know, maybe following the inspiration from common land, how could eco-villages be designed to be more, to become more economically viable? Yeah, Ooh, yeah, that's a tough one. But um, <laughs> first of all, I think that, the, um, you know, you need to think and understand the language. So the language of the investors are basically about two words, risks and returns. Hmm. If they mean returns, it is financial return. But we now can talk about risks in a financial terms as well, because the first three returns of our model are about risks. And we will soon release a report, which we are doing with KPMG to, to show this monetization. Okay. So we, we will soon release a report with KPMG, uh, you know, the, the accountant company, um, okay. 
to show how we monetize those four returns at the landscape scale. So some, some, some suggestions for, for, for the global village um, uh, network global eco village network is um first of all we have we have set up a, a, a website called forreturns.earth where they can upload their in their, their their experiences and connect to this movement the second thing is um think 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 about how your how, what the ecosystem is where you are in where it, where are you based what is the real you know the ecosystem you need to think in ecosystems because that is the entry point for success. If you, so that's how we work. We, 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 we yeah. bring farmers and, and local people, rural people into a kind of, we help them to get the, to give them an overview effect of the area where they live in. And then we identify the acupunctural dots where they should start in doing regenerative or conservation works or tree planting works. Mm. Uh, if you don't understand the ecosystem, you probably are trying to do the wrong things at the wrong place, and then it will not work. While if you push on the right dots in that area, it will go faster. So ecosystem science is important here. And this, the third thing is, is um, <clears throat> um, and that, ha that has to do with working with, with people, um, you know, identify the leaders in a landscape in every place we are we will find local farmers who are doing things in a different way quite often they are ignored by the community because their people think they're crazy because they don't use the farmers recipe that that large that, that, that normal farmers quite often do but those people quite have quite often already have developed the local knowledge uh, to do things in an ecological way uh, you say the same is is of course uh, the same the same happens with indigenous people we really work within the, well with indigenous people because they understand the real profound knowledge of of that area they have that knowledge still and and we need to work and capture that knowledge and work with them to to make it uh, to, to to scale so these things are important so that speak the lang the language of investors and and, and governments um, understand what the local and the rural issues are, find local leaders, uh, talk, and, and what really works well, just repeat talking this four returns language because people are going to understand it faster than you think. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you and, spoke and identify the really zones. Understanding the ecosystem. Yeah. That we're Another thing is what, what we have experienced is as soon as we start in an area and we have, so, you know, with a lot of criteria we, and we come there and or we are invited, we say, you know, we will work with you for at least 20 years. And, yeah. you know, that fact is already transformational. We are not an NGO. We are not a consultant. Uh, we, we just say that we want to continue to walk the path with them together in good times and in bad times because we know how tough it is. You know, and now, now in this in this world where tree planting is becoming a new hype, we need to be very careful, because this is you know tree planting can be good, but it can also be wrong. We can create massive plantations of the wrong species in the wrong places. That's not what we want. Of course, we want to have a good carbon price, and if the carbon prices are good, and we can use it in an, what what I prefer in a four returns approach then we will find the balance between how carbon can accelerate uh, instead of the, uh, yeah, be, be a, a, block, a barrier. Uh, because carbon, you know, if we talk about regenerative agriculture, tree planting, uh, conservation, uh, you know, you know those red projects maybe, then that is all part of, of, uh, of, of revitalizing the system. Uh, but we should always enter from the point of revitalizing the ecological functionality that is number one and then you can look for business cases and for you know community building and all these things Willem thank you so much I think this was really interesting 
As you might know, and probably don't know, but um, the Global Ecovillage Network has been asked now by eight African governments to start national ecovillage development programs. Beautiful. And I feel that we, we need um, the kind of knowledge and also the approaches that you've developed. I think we could have a really useful conversation. And also just by chance, we're right now stepping into a process with the Presence Institute oh, wow. to, to develop our Beautiful. approaches and our vision for how to really follow up with that. So I'd love to stay connected and thank you again so much for taking time to be here with us today. We're going to upload a PowerPoint about your work to the website. So people who are interested in seeing more details mm -hmm. should just go now and download that, have a look and um, also go and browse your website. It's fascinating work and I think it's it's um, one of the approaches we really need at this time. Thank you Willem. Most welcome. I'm hope, I hope uh, this can yeah we can build this movement together. Thank you very much. <laughs>